Welcome to Lockheed Martin Space Makers, where we take you behind the scenes of some of the most challenging and innovative missions. My name is Ben, and I'm your host. This week, we are at Cape Canaveral to cover the Artemis launch in a series of special videos. Today, we're going to be talking with Kelly DeFazio, who is the Director of Production of Orion at Lockheed Martin. Hi, I'm Gary Napier with Lockheed Martin Communications, and joining me is Kelly DeFazio, and Kelly is our Director of Orion Production. So, Kelly, thanks for having us here. Thank you. We're at this amazing facility here, Lockheed Martin's facility called the Star Center in Titusville, Florida. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, the Star Center, we opened it about a year ago, and we really needed it to increase our production throughput to get into that production mode for Artemis. It is a 55,000 square foot facility. We opened it for the off critical path assembly of the TPS systems, the wire harness system, propulsion tubing and ECLIS fabrication. We also build our electrical ground support equipment here. And in this high bay with our new lunarly installed crane, we will uh, assemble and deliver our 16 foot diameter heat shield from here to the operational and checkout facility where we can assemble the spacecraft in its final form. Very cool. We actually had a major reason why we built this facility, so let's get into that a little bit. Artemis 1 is getting ready to go to the moon. We've got Artemis 2 with crew that's going to go in a couple years on Orion, and those are really test flights. You're more responsible for the flights after that. Tell us the difference between those two and then a little bit about this production of the Orions. Yes, yeah, so my responsibility is really to transition the program from the design development phase, as you just talked about with Artemis 1 and 2, and get it into a producible, streamlined, efficient flow for 3, 4, 5, and beyond. And we needed the square footage to be able to uh, build the spacecraft in flow with 3 in flow at once over at the operational checkout facility. And in order to keep that throughput going, we had to take all of the subsystems, get it out of the way. We had to really make room. Uh, we still are a little bit full. We do need some storage space that we're looking for right now, but really to enable the team to uh, increase the throughput and drive down the cost. But so really a modern factory though, is there some, there's some really cool kind of a modern factory aspects to start? Yes, yes. So we have installed in this facility what we call IFF, the Intelligent Factory Framework. And that allows us to connect over 30 pieces of equipment right now. And then of course we'll build on that. But any of the equipment we have in this facility, we've connected to the IFF. And that way we can capitalize on artificial intelligence. And rather than, uh, maintaining that equipment on just an annual tempo or an every six month tempo, we can really monitor the status of the factory equipment and stretch out that maintenance based on how the equipment is doing. So that saves us some time and it also saves us from doing the manual checks. It's all done automatically. So that's just one piece of the uh, smart technology we have in this facility. Another digital transformation project is RTAT, the real-time asset tracking. Mm -hmm. And we have installed not only in the Star Center but also in the ONC. We are installing a system that allows us to track our tooling, our equipment, and even in the, in the next phase, our materials so that we don't have to manually track where is it, where did I put that last, um, it will tell us. It's an intelligent system. Uh, fueled by different uh, tags on each piece of equipment, and it'll tell us where That's it so is. That's so cool. That's so cool. But the the reason we're doing this, though, and, you know, there's always talk about how expensive these development missions are, Artemis 1, 2, and there's a lot of development costs on the front side of it. When we move over to Artemis 3, and we're under contract for Artemis 3, 4, and 5, we really have a different mindset. What are we doing about Artemis 3, 4, and 5 that's so different from the previous ones? Well, like we said earlier, it's yeah. all about uh, getting into the production mode and the sustainability and, in, and in to do that, to bridge us into even beyond five, right? Six, seven, eight, and all the way up. Uh, we need to drive down the cost. Lockheed Martin has committed to 50% cost and we're on plan. We have used an affordability uh, producibility program 
We have over a thousand projects on the books right now to uh, execute to drive down the cost. We've completed 250 of those. And the cost benefit from that can be measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So the team is really rallying about that. We, we get ideas from the floor, our mechanics and technicians on the floor, uh, our designers, and out into our supply chain. So we are using all those ideas uh, to drive down the cost and get on plan, or we are on plan for that. And that will allow us to maintain that one-year center that NASA is um, looking for for the mission manifest, and then we can increase that. We have the capacity with this facility and with the ONC and streamlining our processes to increase uh, the ramp to rate if we need to. So it just depends on whatever NASA needs for their mission manifest. So, so quite a bit of distance between EFT-1 and Artemis-1, a couple years between Artemis-1 and 2, and then we start getting into near yearly cadence. That's pretty fast production. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and the team is, is ready to, to do it. I mean, we, like I said, we have a thousand projects and the team is continuing to come up with ideas. One of the things that we've demonstrated already is the heat shield. As I mentioned, this facility, we will be uh, installing the Avcode on the back of the, the heat shield. Uh, but right now, the heat shield that's sitting on, on the crew module for Artemis One is the fourth one we've built. And the team has incorporated uh, digital transformative projects that has actually taken the original build down to one-fourth the cost already. Uh, one of the, the technologies that we have used, actually a couple of them, when we, we found that when we put um, a couple of those technologies together, it really just becomes exponential from a cost and time savings. So on the heat shield, we have used augmented reality in coordination with smart tools, digital torque tools. Tell, tell me a little bit about what is augmented reality. I know what virtual reality is. What is augmented reality? So, How do you use it in manufacturing? Yes, yeah, so augmented reality, we have the HoloLens goggles. And if you can imagine, you've got you know the goggles on. Uh, it's similar to the games you might have at home, except that you can see the hardware in front of you. But in the foreground, you actually have instructions you know that you can see and it tells you automatically what do you need to put where what tool do you use and literally that information can be downloaded to in this case on the heat shield the smart tool which is our digital torque tool and then when you apply it tells you where to apply the torque it does it automatically and then that information from the torque measurement itself gets downloaded to the work instructions so you can imagine all of the manual work you used to have to do is now gone so we have demonstrated that. We've used it on the heat shield in uh, manufacturing right now for Artemis III and have demonstrated that at this point we are one-fourth of the cost of the original build. That's amazing. That's amazing. So now, the, 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 these technologies are just really exciting. The fact that we're moving in this production is, just, is so exciting. But what's mostly exciting right now is that Artemis I launch. So, just stay tuned, right? It's Absolutely. exciting days ahead. It is, it is exciting, and every time we talk about it in our meetings, you know, people will type in the chat window, oh, I've got chills, oh, this is exciting. And so the team is really amped, and a lot of people are, are moving into the Space Coast for the weekend, and we're going to gather all that data information and use it to our benefit to springboard uh, Artemis II into the next successful mission, and then... Um, move on into three, four, and five. So we are, we're ready to go and the team is excited and we're gonna launch in Great. the next days. Kelly, thank you so much. Thank you. Now that we've learned a little more about Orion's mission, Lauren talks to the chief engineer of Orion to learn more about what a chief engineer does for a program like this and some of the engineering that powers Orion. I'm Lauren Duda in Lockheed Martin Communications, and we're here at the Lockheed Martin Star Center in Florida with Lisa Akers, one of our Orion Chief Engineers at Lockheed Martin. Lisa, can you tell myself and our audience a little bit more about what exactly does a Chief Engineer do? Sure. What are your responsibilities? Yeah, so a Chief Engineer has a really important role in that is maintaining the technical integrity of the vehicle that they're the Chief Engineer for. 
So that means that I have to be aware of and understand the changes that come up, the original design that we came up with, um, and how it's going to be operated by the final user. And all of that results in a lot of meetings and a lot of conversations with our design engineers, with our analysis team, and with the operators. So I spend an awful lot of time talking to people all across the enterprise. That's awesome. Yeah. And so connecting with people all across the enterprise, like mm -hmm. you said, you know, sort of thinking about the people of our future workforce, sure. what is exciting to you about the Artemis program oh, that you wow. think is exciting or would be exciting to the yeah. future workforce? So the coolest thing to me about Orion and, and Artemis in general is that we're going back to the moon to establish residency there. We're going to set up a habitat, have people learn how to live on the moon, how to grow food on the moon, how to you know, prepare so that we can take those people then on to Mars or to other planets that, that we might be interested in exploring. And just the, the possibility of all that exploration is just kind of mind-blowing. It's extremely exciting <laughs> yeah. to me as well. I totally agree. And talking about you know advancing further and further mm -hmm. out in our universe, um, what type of you know advice would you give you know the future workforce? What types of skills do they need to have in order to help us advance that future sure. exploration? Sure. Well, there's a lot of different skills. You know, certainly on the Orion program, we're looking for people who have design engineering skills, both electrical and mechanical. We're looking for folks who do the detailed analysis that figure out what's the pathway from Earth to the moon and back. We have teams of people who are doing systems work, so they're taking all of the different components and putting them together, making sure that they work like they're supposed to work and that we're getting the right output from them, that they're, they're helping to keep the astronauts alive, they're helping to get communications back to Earth. Um, and then we also have engineers who do qualification and verification. So there's testing engineers and assembly engineers. So um, we start out in the design phase and then it gets to places like here at Star Center and we have engineers who are working on building those components to put them onto the spacecraft and test engineers who are testing them once it gets all assembled. So there's all kinds of, of engineering tasks. And even beyond that, we have roles like communications. We have folks who are also involved in our public affairs. We have graphic artists. We have a whole variety of people, um, life sciences, um, human factors engineers, so psychiatrists, psychologists, all of those people are involved in Orion. So if you have an interest in space, there's something to do here with Orion. I completely agree. And it really does take a village to bring this program to fruition. Absolutely. Talking a little bit more broadly about you know, engineering and technician roles at Lockheed Martin, mm -hmm. what types of skills do students graduating need to have to be able to fulfill those types of roles here? Most importantly is curiosity. Being willing to take a look at how are we doing it? Does this make sense? Is this match what, what the gut feel in my, my um, head or the, my gut feel, whatever it is, is, is coming up? Um, does it... Um, seem like the right thing to do. We can teach the skills, right? So skills are, are teachable. You need to come in if you want to be an engineer, of course, you need to have your engineering skills. You need to know the vocabulary of the type of work you're going to do. But more than anything, we want people to step out there and, and want to build the next big thing because absolutely. we're all about great innovation. Yes, absolutely. And beyond kind of like that intellectual curiosity mm -hmm. you talked about, that you know thirst for learning, what other advice would you give to high school or college students looking to enter the aerospace industry? Sure. Um, look at you know look for a college and because you, know, you need a college degree to come in and work as an engineer. So look for a college that's going to offer those kinds of opportunities for you. Um, it may be aerospace. You could get a degree in mechanical engineering, chemical engineering. Um, electrical engineering, aerospace, astronautical engineering, there's just a wide variety, communications, data communications, software engineering, um, any types of, of engineering degrees are gonna put you in a good spot to come into Orion as an engineer. Now, if you're looking to be a technician on our program, here in Brevard County, um, Brevard Community College offers an apprenticeship program. So you can go to Brevard Community College, get your apprenticeship program, and then come out here on the floor and, and learn how to do all of the assembly and test of the spacecraft. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we really do need people of all different types Absolutely. of expertise to work on this program. Now, my last question for you is a bit more of a personal one. Okay. What has been a personal career experience that you feel has shaped your career in, in a major way? Sure. 
the thing that, that I've done that has been most impactful for me and is something I recommend to anybody who's looking to get into engineering is to spend some time doing this work, being in the manufacturing field. I was a manufacturing engineer for 15 years before I came, came to the chief engineer's office. And so having my hands on the hardware, um, working with the technicians, helping them figure out the processes, making sure that it worked, my fingerprints are all over Artemis 1, and I am so excited to watch it launch. So it's been a, a really great opportunity to understand. You know, if you're a design engineer, when you spend time on the floor and you need to put that bolt in a hole that you can't get to, then you can hold it to the design engineer and go, you put this in. And so it helps you become a better designer. It helps you analyze things better because you understand the limitations of how the hardware gets put together. Absolutely, really getting that, that mm -hmm. real-time experience. Well, Lisa, thank you so much. It's been you an bet. absolute pleasure speaking with you it. today. And it's been wonderful learning about your career journey and then also helping other folks understand how they can work on this program, uh, this very exciting program for the space industry. Thanks.